Human trafficking, the trade of humans for the purpose of forced labor, sexual slavery, and other heinous exploitations. Traffickers may use violence, manipulation, or false promises of financial stability or romantic relationships to lure victims into trafficking situations. Human trafficking is often a hidden crime, causing many cases to go unknown. But trafficking is overwhelmingly common and can take place in cities, suburbs, and rural areas alike. Estimates have found that over 40 million people are currently enslaved or being trafficked globally, 79% of those detected being women and children. This year, there's been a 40% increase in human trafficking cases in the US compared to last year. Many attribute this increase to the recent pandemic as more people, especially children, take to the internet to interact with people they may not know. My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'm gonna be sitting down with human trafficking survivors to learn what it's really like to live through such a harrowing and torturous experience. Were these trafficking survivors able to come out of this shocking experience with a newfound appreciation for life? Or do they live every day deeply tortured by the maniacally evil experience they've gone through at the hand of another human being? Hello, Rebecca. Hi, how are you? Chandra. Yes, hi, how are you? Terry. Hello, Anthony. Thank you so much for coming on here and teaching me about the world of surviving human trafficking. I'm honored to be here and to bring this topic. <laughs> what do you consider yourself, a trafficking survivor? Just someone who's incredibly resilient? How we'd like to frame it is we go from a victim to a survivor to a leader. We refer to people who have survived, have a lived experience, and are now giving back a survivor leader. I was a victim, I survived, and now I am a thriver. You're a thriver. So thriver I think and it's better to say that way. <laughs> yes, I yes. Want, I don't want to cut up become a victim all the time. How old were you when you were trafficked? And do you remember the events that led up to that situation? About 18 when I met my trafficker. I was a single young mom trying to put myself through college and I met a young man who I thought had all the answers to all my problems. Everything was about us as a family and just got to know my hopes and my dreams and seemed to have all the solutions. And I thought, man, I've met the one. I've met the one. Mm -hmm. Finally, the tables have turned for me. Unfortunately, you know, the definition of human trafficking is to use force fraud or coercion. I mean, he lied about his age. He lied about what he did. He dated me for six months pretending to be this other person. Six months convincing you that you were in a loving, romantic relationship. They're looking for what you're hungry for and then they'll become that in order to, to get their hooks in. When I was 15 years old, I was raped by a boss. I wasn't prepared for what happened. So that fight, flight and freeze kicked in. And because I didn't kick him, I didn't maim him, I didn't injure him, I didn't consider it rape. I considered it was my fault. And I think psychologically that kind of took over because right after that is when I started using cocaine and uh, marijuana and alcohol and whatever else I could get my hands on at the mm -hmm. time to dissociate. And I started to take a huge downward spiral. So I started going to the streets of Minneapolis where I knew there was a lot of cocaine. And I met a guy. This guy seemed very gentle and he seemed like somebody that could save me. I was a 24 years old. In 1998, political turbulence happened in Indonesia. We won reformation of the government and I wasn't safe at that time. I was a labor right activist. So I went to mm. street, I was marching, I got attention of the government, trying to change the law. You were fighting for the people of your country. If I use all my money to protest, I cannot survive. And my daughter will not go to school because yeah. of, I don't have any more saving. And I decided to go to America. I flew to JFK with the promise they will pick me up, they will pay me 5,000 US dollar a month. But the fact, many people line up behind me with the same destination hotel job in Chicago. I was exchanged with money. You were sold then at that moment? He got a bunch of money from another man. And then he took me to another location, the same experience, I was exchanged with money again. 
at that day I was exchanged to four people. I was aware, but I didn't know that I was kidnapped. I told me his job was relocating him because all of his bands had got gigs there and Las Vegas was the entertainment capital of the world. And so I believed him. We moved into the apartment. His brother had helped us move. And he said, get dressed up. I'm gonna show you out on the town. He looped the car around and parked on the side of the curb. And there was this deserted strip mall on the right side. There was no lights, no signs. And he put the car in park and said, um, I spent a lot of money to get you here. We're gonna need to get that money back. Well, do you see that door right there? That's an escort service. And I'm gonna need you to sign up. And I said, escort sounds like prostitution. No way. That's when he slapped me across the face. And he said, you're gonna go in that room and you're gonna get my money back. So I, I complied, I complied out of fear. I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna get the money and things will get better tomorrow. The lady has me give her my ID to show I'm over 18 and she hands me some paperwork to fill out and I kind of am stopping to read and she said, it just says that you won't solicit. We don't hire those kind of girls. And I was like, oh, see, like I can trust him. That was it, I signed up, got in the car and the phone started ringing immediately. And I just remember starting to cry and thinking like, how did I get here? I was a good kid from a good home. I was a varsity athlete. I was accepted into university. Like when did suddenly my boundaries get so pushed by someone that completely has tricked me into, I just felt so used and so deceived and now I don't know where my daughter is and I'm 19 and I've been hit for the first time. So now I know, right, that things can get dangerous. And I started feeling really, um, not just hopeless, but just really sad. Like, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so ashamed to admit to people that I've crossed these lines that like, I just, or I wouldn't do. But I, I know I can remember feeling like, what's my other option? go back to being on in poverty as a single mom, lonely and sad, alone, unwanted, unimportant. You feel sometimes stuck between like, hoping it gets better or going back to what you hated. And, yeah. and not knowing that it's gonna get worse. Like when you don't know it's gonna get worse, you just hope that like tomorrow will be better. Three or four months being with this guy that he would do things like this. He would say that he's gonna go out and re up meaning go get some more cocaine, because he always had a lot of cocaine. And in the meantime, someone would knock on, on our apartment door and they would come in and say, I'm waiting for to come back with some drugs. Do you mind if I sit here? So he puts the cocaine, the crack out on the table and says, help yourself. Well, no, I'm not gonna help myself. I don't have any money. Um, and I'm not gonna do any sexual favors, so I'll just wait. And he goes, no, seriously, just help yourself. He'll be back in a minute. I did the cocaine and then when it was done, the person that was there, you know, made me do favors for them. Yeah. And what I hadn't known was that they had paid for that in advance. Oh. Yeah, and then the trauma that lives in our body compounds with all this and pretty soon we're stuck. You were addicted to this drug, they they knew that you would do anything for the drug, even though you didn't know that you were signing up to do anything for the drug. It just Right, exactly. Happened. But I ended up doing some things that I'm not happy with because of being in the life and being very, um, trying to survive. He drove about five to 10 minutes away from his house. He rang the bell. Mama San, this is a new girl. I knew Mama San is the woman that runs a brothel. Did you know what was about to happen at that point? I didn't know what is that, but I knew this is something wrong going on. In few hours, I was end up in the hand of sex buyers. My trafficker told me, you have to pay 30,000 US dollar to be free. So I was trapped in captivity. How did you earn money in that situation then? One sex buyer will deduct $100 from the manipulation tab. <laughs> Every day, morning to night time, 24 hours, I was sitting in the living room with the disco light, drug on the table, alcohol on the table, and, uh, you know, without clothes. They played with a quarter. If I don't make a quarter for 2,000, I will not get food. Mm. According to get that quarter, sometimes 
we have to fight with life and with other girls because of hungry. Before we learn more about the world of surviving human trafficking, I can remember rushing my daughter to her room and shutting the door and saying, don't come out until I come and get you. I could hear him like screaming and and there's like blood on the floor as you drag him to his room. I was leading this movement to jump out. Two stories building bathroom. I just wanted to take a moment to mention that I've linked some resources down below to learn more about human trafficking. And stay tuned because in just a few minutes, we're gonna learn some key red flags that could alert you to a potential trafficking situation. And if you wanna watch more episodes about survivors with some incredibly inspiring stories, I'll go ahead and throw up a link up here for you to watch I Spend a Day with Kidnapping Survivors and Survivors of Police Brutality. Now back to learning about the world of surviving human trafficking. Can you explain how, how long this went on and, and how much worse it got and your thought process throughout that? In nearly six years, I ended up getting bought and sold between three different traffickers. I've had two of them brand me like a piece of cattle. Literally branded. Face broken in five places, hospitalized for dehydration and over exhaustion. I've been to jail a lot. Ended up getting strung out on drugs by 21. I was a full blown addict. By the end, I was in a home for three years with, with three other women and two children. So it becomes this very many cult-like family where then you also become bonded with the other women where now you're like, and I could physically run out the door, but I can't leave her. What's gonna happen to her son? You almost don't wanna save yourself unless you can save everyone. One time I can remember him saying, um, I was really sick. I'd gotten like the flu and I, you know, had really bad fever and chills and throwing up. And I would say, I, call and say, I need to come home. I'm really sick. And he'd say, if you come home, you'll come home to swing and hangers, bitch, and hang the fun up on me. As if he had just picked up everything and left. Those two words, and I knew that um, I wouldn't see my daughter. I wouldn't know where to look. And so you you push it down, you suck it up, you move forward. I just didn't know how I was gonna get out. Like it felt like no matter what escape I tried, it wasn't working. I got all the way home and he showed up too. Like you're just living in this tornado of fear. It's like playing Russian roulette with buyers. Every time you knock on the door, you don't know if it's gonna be a serial killer or some crazy dude. And so it's just like living in this prolonged state of fear. And how did you eventually finally escape? It was the night before Easter. And I remember thinking, we have nowhere to go tonight. I am so sick of this life. I fell asleep with a cart of things at TJ Maxx. I was gonna give my kids a whole bunch of Easter things and drop it off at their house. And then I didn't know what was gonna happen after that. I pushed it out the door. Cops were swarmed all over me because they watched me. I fell asleep for God's sake. And I went to jail. I had 11 bench warrants in three different counties. I was gonna be doing some time. And at the same time, one of the guards said, I think you're pregnant. They did a test, a pregnancy test. I found out I was. And then I decided, you know what? I, I don't want this life anymore. The bigger event that led to me finally escaping was he actually uh, beat up the little, the boy that was in the home. He was 15. It was his son. He came in and um, my trafficker just started beating him like a grown man. And I can remember rushing my daughter to her room and shutting the door and saying, don't come out until I come and get you. And um, I could hear him like screaming and, and there's like blood on the floor as you drag him to his room. And at that point I called home and I said, I told my aunt what had happened. My aunt works, worked at a domestic violence shelter at the time as a children's advocate. She said, that's gonna happen to your daughter. And I said, no, he loves her. He wouldn't do that. And she said, because she's seven and, and she's compliant. When she talks back for the first time, that will happen to your daughter. I couldn't risk it for my, my girl anymore. And so the first opportunity that he was out of town, I called my mom and asked her to put plane tickets on a credit card. Cause I didn't, you know, you don't have any money and he takes yeah. everything. And my mom of course said yes. And that's it. My plan was like, I'm just going to sleep on couches, get on food stamps, get on government housing. 28 years old. I got a criminal record. I ended, you know, got all this prostitution related charges on my record. Like, what do you do? You're right back to the same vulnerabilities of being a single mom in poverty, trying to make ends meet. But now I've got all this other compounded, right? Huge gap in job history, criminal record, PTSD, like extreme amount of PTSD from all the 
trauma and the cult's behavior. It's just a lot. It's a lot to try to figure out. So I tried to escape for many time. One one time I was in Connecticut during this situation, they took me to different states. So you were never in one spot long enough for anyone to even be able to find you or report that you were there or for you to communicate with anyone else. When I was in Connecticut, I tried to to jump. I just make a, a connection in between all the seat, my clothes, just to jump out from that wood, and I couldn't get there. Even though I was a Girl Scout, so I knew how to survive. So you were you were connecting every piece of fabric to try to loot to lo try to drop yourself down from the window. But I couldn't get to the ground because it was so high. And yeah. I realized it was in the wood, dark. So I climb up and I said, I am trapped. So you actually secured this, this thing out the window and then you climbed down and then you realized that you're just in the middle of the woods and you couldn't run anyway. And then you climbed all the way back up? Some girls holding that, you know. Oh, it was like a team effort then. Yeah, we tried to escape. All of us escaped but it yeah. wasn't uh, it wasn't success uh, they took me back to brooklyn new york and i said this is an opportunity for me to go to the airport and my trafficker slapped the bouncer slapped i sneaked out to the bathroom and i saw a little window uh, yeah i went to to the kitchen try to find what uh, you know knife I couldn't find it, so I used a little spoon. To unscrew the window? And thank God, it Whoa. was open. When it opened, what, what was your feeling seeing that you had this opportunity to maybe finally escape? The girls behind me at that time. So I was leading this movement to jump out. It was so high. How high was it, do you think? Two stories building bathroom. You had to take that risk. I will make it. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen, I jump. And did you hurt yourself that you're on your fall? No pain, no nothing. I ended smoothly, but the 12 years old girl jumped on me and it was... <laughs> it just jumped on you? Like, it was painful. Without warning, just like, oh, a body is on me now. We ran, I wave my hand. One day I will pick you up. And then you had to wave up at everyone else and say, I'll rescue you. It, I was I was crying, Anthony. It was, it was sad, you know? It was yeah. sad that you see, I, I, I have my freedom outside. So when I see, I see that window, it is like, like a chill. It's really like, yeah. you yeah. cannot imagine that the girl inside, and I was outside and I knew exactly how it was difficult. Yeah. And then we went to law enforcement, we went to consular general, nobody helped us. So you were just left there to fend for yourself and figure out how to earn some kind of money to get a flight back home and then you at the same time are seeking justice for the girls that are being trafficked and you promised them that you would save them as well. I really experienced in the become a homeless. There was a man, he was a US Navy naval officer. He sat next to me and asked me about many things and I told him and he said, I will help you. Come back tomorrow at noon. You know, Anthony, I didn't know what was noon. Situation. I really learned and what the said, word noon meant at that point. I didn't know what was noon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he told me, okay, are you ready? And he called FBI. Uh, he spoke to the officer and the investigation started. The law enforcement took me to raid the location because of I have all the notes in my bag. So snapper, undercover, all maybe a bunch of law enforcement surrounded this place because I said, this is a place, this is a place. You were there and you saw it get surrounded? I saw it like in the movie, how they hate the place. It was amazing. I was crying loud when the girl out only with, with the towel. All they right. were, you know, without clothes. So were these the same girls that you promised that you would save? Some, were they the yes, same ones? Yes, some of them are not. Yeah, some of them are not. And then the police officer make a hole, asked me to peep through the hole. 
to identify who are they and I say like it was Johnny Wong. Yes, it is, it is. Wow. Did you what do you know what that caused for him? I testified wow. They were convicted and prosecuted. You found yourself in one of the most horrifying situations that anyone could find themselves in, in a foreign country with no idea what anything was. You sought justice and then you actually were able to bring these people that are part of these sex trafficking rings to justice as well. It's not easy, but uh, right. uh, we have to talk about it. Has this network of people or any of the people involved with trafficking you been held accountable in any way? Not in this life. <laughs> Nothing um, legally? Yeah, none of my traffickers have ever been in trouble for trafficking. One thing that I was angry because the people that bought my body, that bought those girls' body, Actually, I have all the information because when people bought my body, I tried to be nice. What is your name? I put in my notes. So you had all of their names. And I gave yeah. the law enforcement, but there wasn't any prosecution. So these people that were in charge of it were prosecuted, but none of the people that actually took advantage of you and abused you and your body and used you were have received any kind of punishment at all. The most abusive People in this network, not only trafficker, but sex buyers. How has your life changed since being trafficked? We have scar because of, you know, experience in the hand of trafficker, traffickers and sex buyers. Yeah. It gives me a scar that Absolutely. cannot go away. So I visited psychiatric therapist constantly, regularly, because of, I need help. Because I'm sure that you're, you're constantly thinking that at any moment you could be trafficked again. Yes, that's so true because of when I walk around, oh, they might be a victim or myself. I have to be careful. What do you think was the most difficult part about uh, adapting back to normalcy after being trafficked. For me, it became this, my own kind of spiritual journey of like, why did I live when others had died? And, and is there a power greater than myself? And, and so that first year I can remember having this moment where I just was like, I just got mad at God. I was just like, this sucks too, man. Like, is this, is this my future to live in this hopelessness and poverty and this government subsidized crappy apartment with cockroaches? Like, I don't want this either. I felt like I had this piercing thought that went through my mind. It wasn't this audible, like, thus saith the Lord. It was this, like, <laughs> right, right. piercing thought that radically cut through my hopelessness like a knife. And I can remember having this thought, if you give me the same amount of time that you gave the enemy, I will never be outdone. Yeah, I can't actually undo in 30 days what right. took six years of being exploited to do to my psyche to do to my mm -hmm. mental health, to do to my financial economic empowerment or lack thereof. And mm -hmm. so I just, in that moment, I remember kind of something shifted and I thought, all right, as hard as this is gonna get, I got to give this new life a try for six years. I have to, like I, yeah. I have to give them the same amount of time. Yeah, because it's, it's not just about escaping and then everything's good. It's, it's about this, this long recovery process. And I feel like you were so, powerful in that moment to give yourself as much time to recover as as much time as had been taken away from you. You hear stories about other people that have built something with their lives or came out of rough circumstances. We all know lots of people we've at least heard about on television or read about on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know what, if other people have figured this out, I can too. What do you think should be done to prevent others from experiencing what you did? Prevention through education and public awareness. So it needs to be discussed openly and frequently to everyone. Yes, and also we as a people who know don't give a wrong message. Human trafficking is hidden. You cannot see with your plain sight. Moonchild wants to know what the biggest red flag was that you wish that you'd have seen sooner. The whole job situation was something that I wish I would have seen sooner. You know, frequent trips out of town, two cell phones, job mm -hmm. that no one can visit, um, really hypersexual culture. 
mm. fueling um, hypersexuality often. Like, well, let's go to the strip club. Well, you should get up there. Well, my last girlfriend did it. You know, all these things that continually push your boundaries little by little by little. Do you think there's any one type of person that is more at risk for being trafficked? One of the things, Anthony, what I do when I go out and do trainings is I'm going to walk around the room and I'm going to look everyone in the eye. Those people that give me eye contact, I'm not going to mess with them. The people that look away or, or don't give me eye contact, they are good candidates. Chances are they have lower self-esteem, mm. okay? If you're coming from a broken home, mm. if you're in foster care, um, all kinds of different ways that, mm -hmm. that people are targeted. But the most vulnerable people are those of us that have the pre-existing conditions. Like I said, a lot of our girls have autism, right. multiple personality disorders, whatever, came from a foster care system, were sexually abused before the age of 10. Those are the folks that they're gonna look for. They're gonna look outside of AA meetings. They're gonna look outside of schools. They're gonna try to get folks young because the younger you are, the easier it is to mold them. Has your experience being trafficked influenced the way that you raise your own kids? Oh, uh, well, absolutely. You would be surprised that she was like, you've made me afraid of everything. I'm like, <laughs> I think it's normal to carry your keys as a weapon when you're on your own. Right. <laughs> yeah, you gotta stab someone in the eye if they get close, maybe. I'm a lot more aware and alert about um, the way that predatory behavior targets different age groups just because of the work I'm in. But I think I'm a lot more lax than people would think I am. You know, I, I want my daughter to go date people. I want her to have a normal life. I yeah. I just want her to be smart. And I can remember recently she was, she had said she was going out with someone and we, I was like, oh, what's their name? And she's like, mom, I know you're going to do like the whole check on. And then, and then it's that funny time when you're like, oh, nice to meet you. And you're thinking, and I know your mom's name's Karen and your dad is Steve. And you're <laughs> <laughs> you went full investigatory mode on that. Yeah, all the time. Yes, yeah, sometimes I become overprotective. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you experience firsthand. Yeah, especially to my daughter. My daughter is 24 years old. Where did you go? What day? And it, yeah. mom, I'm okay. I'm a adult. But still. It is a little bit over the top sometimes, but at the same time, you experience firsthand. Your, your children probably understand, right? Yeah, my children now uh, knew that uh, they said, I'm so proud of you, mama. So I was crying. Yeah. This is just, yeah, just amazing that my family support me. Why do you think it's so difficult for some people to understand just how common human trafficking really is? I guess if you haven't been addicted, if you haven't been in the life, if you don't understand systems of oppression, if you don't understand marginalized folks, then you're not gonna get it. Right. When you live in your bubble and you don't get out of that. When you have privilege, you don't understand the lengths that some people will go that do not have privilege to have safety, to have shelter, to have some money and some peace of mind. And the situations Absolutely. that you can find yourself in when you get desperate. If we would rewind all this and go back to when I was 14 years old, I would say, Anthony, you are absolutely out of your mind. None of those things will ever happen to me. I will never go through any of that. If you could say something to anyone watching who is thinking that they may be part of a trafficking situation themselves, is there anything that you'd want to say to them? I mean, if anyone is forcing you to do anything you're not comfortable with, um, it doesn't just have to feel like this big giant word of human trafficking. If anyone is forcing you to do something with a friend, a buddy, a landlord, a drug dealer that you feel really uncomfortable doing and you're feeling pressured, um, please reach out for help. There are tons of advocates that want to help you, that want to support you, that want to help you get your dreams without that person um, intimidating you or pressuring you. You can always call the human trafficking hotline, which is 1-888-3737-888. And it's gradual and it can happen from the person that you trust most in your life, the person that you could never imagine deceiving you or taking advantage of you in any way. Right. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly in the camera. Go. www.mentariusa.org and be a part of this movement. Go buy my book, In Pursuit of Love, on Amazon. Download the Audible. It's me reading it. It's going to give you a lot more info on how you can get involved in the fight. Check out our website. Check out the resources and get some education and use that as a tool to help other people get out the life. The most important thing is subscribe to Anthony Padilla. <laughs> Link and be a part of it!
kids. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I feel like I I understand the world of human trafficking just a little bit more. Thanks so much for having me on and using your platform to raise real awareness. You've got such a great reach. You can use it for anything, and we appreciate you. After spending the day with these incredibly strong trafficking survivors, I've come to understand just how much it takes for one to not only go through such a horrific and life-altering event, but to also advocate and spread awareness about it in order to protect millions of others who may fall into similar situations. See you later, bye guys. Press a like. I will go to America. Mm -hmm. I will eat pizza hut. I will eat McDonald's. I will get <laughs> a dollar. <laughs> McDonald's, baby. You know? America. And I I might meet Whitney Houston. <laughs> you thought you might meet I Whitney Houston here. I didn't know you before, but I knew Whitney Houston.